As you know, uh, those of you who've been here for the last number of years, we always begin with the Car Club or Hail Mary and the Lord B. And the first week we do it for our Holy Father and his needs and intentions. The second week we'll do it for Bishop Bradley and his needs and intentions. I think this year, uh, for the third session when we pray, we will pray for our nation. And then we'll pray for our parishes. We and then we'll pray for ourselves on the visit, having prayed well for everyone else, right? <laughs> so we'll begin in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the stay of our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who Do you hear? 
hear something more than simply difficulty remembering, that the creed is an expression of the faith of the whole church, and that when we stand shoulder to shoulder at Mass, it is the spirit of truth that has given us the truth of the creed, that Holy Spirit binding us together as one body, that we hold one another together and we hold each other up. That is true not only when we recite the creed, but when we live the truth of the faith, which the creed professes, that's also very important. Beginning though with the I believe in one God, it makes it personal. It is something that we ourselves are putting a personal stand on. And therefore, one might ask the question, is that true? Do I really believe all of these things? Do I? What's wonderful about the creed is it implies that God has made himself known. That he is not a stranger. The theologians and often the mystical theologians tell us that God desires to be known and loved and understood. In the past, people would say things like, well, why doesn't God make himself known or God is mysterious, he's so far out there, why would he bother with the likes of us? But when you talk to those who have known, and in our Christian tradition, great saints like St. Bernard of Clairvaux, or St. Teresa of Avila, John the Cross, which you know, are very dear, near and dear to my heart, they found a deep and personal and intimate relationship with God. God, of course, desires to be known and understood and loved. Therefore, what we recite in the creed must become more than simply the deposit of faith or theological dogma, but a lived and personal experience of the Holy Father John Paul II when preparing the church for the new millennium, said that what would be necessary in the new millennium were that we had a people of God that were not only faithful, but this is his word, that they were also mystics. Now what did he mean by that? Did he mean that we should all be sitting around and having visions? I don't think so. But what he was implying was the need for a deep and intimate relationship with God and Christ Jesus with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. That God should be known and understood, and that in that knowing of God, we might find the full meaning of our own life, our own raison d'etre, our reason to be, and to find a path of holiness there as we pursue that relationship. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Interesting how those two words come together. God Almighty. That might be rather intimidating, wouldn't it? And for some, a little off-putting. And yet, the proper word that comes first is Father. Not the kind of Father that you would imagine that modeled themselves after Mussolini or Adolf Hitler, but a true father who desires to nurture and love each of his children to wholeness and holiness. That that almighty power is not given, is not present to work against us or to punish us. But that full and almighty power of the Father is meant for our good. It is that almighty power of the Father that called all things into being. Did God need creation? Well, I don't think so. But it was the love of the Father that needed to express itself. Can we, I mean, in our own experience, can we ever say that we truly love someone without an external expression of love. 
I don't know how many couples I've counseled over the years where the husband or the wife, in the past I would say usually the wife, but not so much anymore. There's an interesting thing going on in our marriages these days, which we'll talk about next week. That's what they call a teaser, throwing that <laughs> for next week's talk. But they come and they say, when they come to talk to me, one of them will eventually say, but you never tell me that you love me. You never show me that you love me. You may say you love me, but you don't show me that you love me. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. That covers a lot of territory, doesn't it? Visible and invisible. For some of us, that invisible part, we think of angels. For the scientists among us, atoms. And those things that can only be seen through the technology that extends our senses. And yet all are from the Father's hand. Created in love as an expression. Love must beget. And all that is comes from the hand of the Father. That means all of creation, the seen and unseen, visible and invisible bears the fingerprints, if you would, of the Father. Do you believe that? Imagine how we might look at our creation and the way we use it. If we consider that everything that exists is an expression of the Father's love, whether we understand it that way in the moment or not. Perhaps it is impossible for us to live every moment with that kind of awareness. We'd probably be crazy if we tried to live that way. And yet in our more thoughtful moments, ought we not reflect on that? That the creation comes from the hand of the Father, Almighty, created out of love. Even the things we don't see. I have one gentleman who knows me who really wants to be my friend, but it aggravates him that I'm a priest and I believe in all this stuff. <laughs> he said, I just, I just can't get this invisible stuff. I said, you don't believe in invisible stuff? He said, well, no. I said, well, what a shame, because then you must never have experienced love. Well, so can, can you... Do you always see love? He's got to get back to me about that. <laughs> I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. Now, in that two short paragraphs, it, it seems a bit repetitious, doesn't it? And yet, what the fathers were saying was that Jesus and the Father, the Son and the Father, are one God. That they coexisted from the very beginning. Jesus. We know him as Jesus in his humanity, right? The word becomes flesh. But he coexisted with the Father. Begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. Maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, this same Jesus Christ, our Lord, begotten, not made, through him all things were made. Christ is present when all of creation comes into existence. 
This was very important because there were many people who were trying to figure out exactly who Jesus was at the time of the writing of the creed. There were those who said that Jesus was not really God, but highly favored by God. Because only God could be God. And those, there were those who said, no, Jesus was God, but he was never really human. He was pretending to be human, but he never really suffered, and he never really was tempted, and he never really died, so he could never really rise from the dead. This was all just a show to get our attention to tell us how much God loved us. And there were those that said, well, isn't that Jesus guy, isn't he a lot like Hercules, going to the Greek and Roman uh, pantheon of gods and goddesses? See, Hercules was the son of Zeus, born of a, a mortal woman, Alchemy, and so he was a demigod. And with that kind of thinking floating around in the Greco-Roman world, there were many who kind of thought of Jesus that way. So the creed had to be very definite to say, no, he is co-eternal and co-equal with the Father. And that's why we get that wonderful word, consubstantial. And I know some people get very angry at that in <laughs> It is very amusing in a certain way. It is a return to the actual word, the English translation of the actual word that was used by the council to describe Jesus. What we used to say was one in being with the Father, as opposed to consubstantial with the Father. And I'm reflecting on that in this new English translation, it was simply thought that that didn't quite say it. And why would they think that? Well, it's as simple as this. All of us here right now at this moment are one in being together in this building, right? In this cathedral church, we are one in being together here. But we are not of the same substance, huh? And what the council wanted to make clear is that Jesus and the Father are of the same substance. They are both God, both divine, and not even separate divinities, but one God of the same substance. That's what the word consubstantial is getting to us. So this is what they call the teachable moment. If you had some misgivings about consubstantial, I hope you'll be able to, like I have, begin to set those aside and understand the theological truth of what's trying to be communicated here. Through him all things were made, and for us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. This is where we get into the word made flesh business. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary and became man. Again, incarnate, incarnational theology, that the second person of the Trinity, the Son, took on our humanity, an action of the Holy Spirit. He who was uncreated truth, uncreated wisdom, comes into the world and becomes created truth, created wisdom, when he takes on our body. His divinity he had from the beginning. His humanity he receives from Mary. And so you have Jesus Christ, true God and true man. What does he receive? He receives a human body, a human soul, and the human free will. Which is why we say, a man, a human being like us in all things but sin. That's very important. Otherwise, how could he be a model for us? And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate in the Virgin Mary and became man. For our Jewish brothers and sisters, it is an impossibility, at least if they follow the Orthodox beliefs of the Jewish church, the Jewish religion. How could God take on our humanity? That's a 
stumbling block for them. And that is why we must understand that the belief in this, I believe and I ask you again, do you believe this? When you stand at Mass and you recite the creed, do you believe this? It's, it's at the heart of what it means to be Christian. It is the ancient faith of the Church. It is the truth that was from the beginning, although not defined in the beginning, which has now over the centuries been defined and has become the bedrock of our faith. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, and was buried, and rose on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Interesting. Part of the, uh, again, going back to the Christological controversies, those who did not believe that Jesus took on any humanity, but was only God pretending to be man, this says, no, he really did suffer. He really was tempted. And what's interesting about that temptation is, you know, I take great comfort in the fact that Jesus was tempted. I hope you do too. Because so often we feel that any temptation that pops in our minds must mean that we're bad people, right? But let me assure you that no one of us has such control over our mind or our imagination that we can control what thoughts, what temptations, what images pop into our heads. It's, sin is not in what pops into our heads. It's what we choose to do with it after it's there. Do we entertain those thoughts and elaborate on them? Or even worse, do we engage them and start acting on them? But it is somehow for me quite comforting to know that Jesus understands that. And that he was tempted but did not sin. So I think that's some good news occasion when people come to confession to me and they say, these thoughts pop into my head and I say, well, what do you do with them in the sack? I pray and ask God to take them away and I said, well, do you do anything else with them? No. I said, the good news is you're fighting a good fight and you have not sinned in that. If I thought you had control, unlike any other human being, to banish such thoughts from your head and never have them again, you might be accountable, but Christ Jesus himself, the Word made flesh, couldn't do that. So I'm not surprised that we can't either. The other nice thing about that is when we think of the Garden of Gethsemane, when Christ is very aware of what is about to happen and what he's going to suffer, what does he say? Father, all things are possible for you. If, I can, if this cup can pass from me, let it pass. But not my will, but your will be done. I don't know, I take great comfort in that. Maybe there's something wrong with me. But it says that when you and I get a little weak in the knees, when we're facing adversity, and hardship, that we might ask the Father too if it's possible to accomplish your purposes another way. Can we? But we also need that second part of that story, don't we? Where Jesus says, but not my will, but your will be done. The incarnational theology of the church is very helpful. For Christ comes to teach us how to live the divine life humanly with all the fragility and weakness that we are subject to as people, which Christ himself and his humanity had to deal with as well. He shows us a better way. And that when we seek forgiveness for the times where when we do fail, we are not only forgiven, but an infusion of that very life of Jesus Christ that puts us up, sets us up, and puts us back on track to begin 
to have the life of Christ now recapitulated in our own daily struggles and problems and concerns. For our sake, he was crucified under conscious fire, suffered death, and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The scriptures, of course, being those places where Christ himself would say to his disciples, his apostles, the Son of Man must suffer, be condemned and put to death, and buried, and rise again on the third day. The disciples didn't know what that meant at the time, but it was only after his resurrection. But it was recorded in all of the Gospels, so that you and I might believe. Christ knew, but it did not uh, lessen the struggle that he had to consent to do the Father's will. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. That ascension into heaven part is very important too. Some theologians talk about the divinization of Christ in his humanity. What does that mean? It means that because Christ had a human free will, he could consent to do the Father's will or not. When you hear the stories in Scripture, listen carefully. Every encounter with Jesus, the people he meets, every action, every activity, he consents to do the Father's will. Think about the Samaritan woman at the well. Or think about the woman who comes because her daughter is possessed by a demon. And she first asks Jesus to come and cast out the demon from her daughter. And his first response is one that his disciples probably were shaking their heads, yes, that's right. It is not right to take the food of the children and give it to the dogs. But she persists. Even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of the children. And then he gives the answer that is true. For having said this, she spoke the truth. Let it be done as you have said, and her daughter is free from the demon. Isn't that amazing how the truth rolls out bit by bit, but he consents to do the Father's will in all things. And so might you and I, by his grace, I would think for us that it's a lifetime project. It simply can't be accomplished by our own best efforts because it isn't a work of humanity, it is a work of God. It is a divine thing at work in us. We see it in Jesus and his ascension into heaven is significant in this. In his divinity, he's never really left the Father's side, has he? But that his humanity, barred from paradise by Adam and Eve, now finds its place before the Father, co-eternal with the Father, that now our humanity finds its true home in heaven. That completes what they call the divinization of Christ's humanity. Now, not only in his divinity, but in his humanity, he reigns eternally with the Father in heaven. Which means you and I have something to look forward to that our final destination cannot be completed here, even if we were to live for 10,000 years on the face of the planet. This isn't home anymore. It's temporary. Like the color of your hair. It's temporary. <laughs> but what we have to look forward to, and the word became flesh, what it means to be a real man, a real woman, believer and unbeliever alike has now been changed. Our capacity for relationship with God has now changed. No longer simply servants to the supreme being, but glorious daughters and magnificent sons. That we recapitulate by the grace of God, according to the Father's will and the grace of Jesus, 
and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the transformation of our own being into the very likeness of Jesus. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. There will be no other messiahs. He is the, truly the Savior of the world for all people, believer and unbeliever alike. Because the grace of God, believe it or not, does reach beyond the boundaries of the church, right? I'm not suggesting that that is the ordinary way of salvation by any means. But, to put it another way, God can save you if he wishes. But we know that if we follow the path laid out for us, there is a promise and a guarantee. This judging of the living and the dead, that always is a little bothersome, isn't it? For those who would like to portray Christ as just some sort of sugar daddy that really, it doesn't really matter what we say and do. He has to love us. Everybody goes to heaven. Nobody is condemned. The judgment of God is really very interesting. The judgment of God is this. We will get what we have chosen. You know, if you want to see who's holding the scales, look at your own conscience. It isn't God up there saying, let's see, they did this many good things and this many bad things because of what's exactly right. It's what we have chosen, what we cling to in our heart of hearts, what our will embraces, even when we can't make it happen on a daily basis, but we seek forgiveness and reconciliation and we continue to cling to that good. That's what it is. It's a choice of the will. And that, by the way, is what love is. Love is not a gooey feeling. It is a choice of the will. I choose to act in love. I choose to embrace the truth. And by that choice, we engage in an activity, a life pursuing union with God and Christ Jesus. So it does matter what we say and do. It does matter what we choose. It does matter how we acknowledge the rule of Christ. That, that wonderful, you know, underplayed feast, solemnity that we have at the end of every liturgical year, the Sunday before the first Sunday of Advent. Christ the King. Some people would say, well, perhaps we should have Christ the President or Christ the this, that, the other. No, it's Christ the King. And do we believe that? That we are subjects of our loving brother, Jesus Christ, who is our King and to whom we will have to give an account. One of the things that upsets some people is in the resurrection, at the end of all things. All of our histories are going to be revealed, and everybody's going to know everything about all of us. I can tell by the look on some of your faces, that is not meant as good news. <laughs> Maybe you've seen it on my face and my blush. <laughs> And yet, what will be most true in that moment of that complete revelation? That in the kingdom of God, all things have now been reconciled with the Father through Christ Jesus. And all of the mistakes and errors and sins that we have sought forgiveness for are not a means of our shame, but give glory to God who stood so low to take the likes of us and transform us into sons and daughters. Think about St. Paul when he was Saul, standing there at the stoning of Stephen. Those two in the kingdom of heaven are just like this now. Interesting thought to that, isn't it? They're the best of buddies in the kingdom of heaven. Stephen is not angry that Paul 
formerly Saul, is his brother in the kingdom. And Paul is not ashamed any longer of what he did as Saul. All will be revealed in what is mostly revealed is the love of God in Christ Jesus that reconciles all things to the Father. So don't worry about that other part. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. Again, the third person, the Holy Spirit, co-eternal with the Father and the Son. One God, three persons. The Lord, the giver of life, which means all that has life comes from the Holy Spirit of God. That marvelous thing. I think often about the uh, story of creation, the second story of creation in Genesis, where it talks about how God fashioned the male and female of the stuff of the earth. And while they were beings, they didn't become nephish hayah, living human beings, as God intended, until he breathed his own spirit, the Holy Spirit, into them. And to think that it is the Holy Spirit, which is the source of our immortal soul. It is so tender at times to be present, to have the honor of being present with someone as they're passing, especially if they are prepared for their passing, for their death. The very first time that happened to me, I was a chaplain at Medical College of Ohio in Toledo, and there was a woman who was dying, and her family couldn't get there, but they asked if somebody could be with her because they were going to take her off the machine. So I was sitting with her, I didn't know her. But I thought, well, oh, I should do something besides sit here. So I was praying and I held her hand. And the breathing kept getting slower and slower and more labored and more labored. And then it would seem like it would just stop. And then you'd get it. Not done yet. And what was going on, at least as I understand it, maybe I'm wrong, a dialogue between God and that soul. Calming whatever fears were still present, resolving whatever loose ends may have been there, until finally at the end, second before I was holding the hand of a person. And then I was simply holding the hand of a body. She had breathed her soul, that Holy Spirit, that immortal soul of hers, back to the source from which it came. Now that's the way to go. Tears, no fears. But God gave grace and time that He who is the source of all life, the giver of life, who was present at the moment that that woman was conceived, was also present at the moment of her passing. And every moment in between. Proceeding from the Father and the Son, they don't work apart from each other. They work together. One divine will, <coughs> adored and glorified, spoken through the prophets, the same Holy Spirit that prompted Isaiah and Samuel and Jeremiah and Micah and all the rest to speak the truth to the people of God, to be heralds like Elijah of the coming of the Messiah in the person of John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit that prompted John the Baptist to leap in his mother's womb when Jesus in the womb of Mary was present. Interesting, isn't it? 
the same Holy Spirit that was poured out on us at the moment of our conception, but again at baptism, confirmation. And every time the Holy Spirit is invoked, one of the things we learned last year at our priest convocation that made me awful. Glad to be a priest. I mean, I'm glad to be a priest anyway. But it was one of those little things you never think about. And suddenly, somebody else tells you something they've been thought you should have known. And it's like hearing it for the first time. Cardinal Donato talked about the joy of the priesthood as guardians of the epiclesis. Now, at Mass, the epiclesis for us is when the priest puts his hands into the gifts that are to become the body and blood of Christ and invoke the Holy Spirit upon them. That's the epiclesis. The invocation of the Holy Spirit, and I think of that now at Mass, when I invoke the water over the Father, the Holy Spirit over the water at baptism, when I invoke the nuptial blessing on the couple that's being married, when I absolve people, and when people bring pictures or statues or rosaries or crosses to invoke the Holy Spirit, 